going to start with Mary Ann Williams. She was a well-educated English woman from the upper middle class, and her family was involved in the lace-making industry. Her father was the mayor of Nottingham, and she was to be the future wife of the missionary Henry Williams, sent to New Zealand by the, Christ the Church Missionary Society in 1823. Sarah Selwyn, whom we will meet later, had this to say about these missionary women. They were a noble set, greatly aiding the work going on. Most of them had large families. They lived for some time in small raupo or reed houses far from the few settlers of those days, taking care always to have windows to the ground in case of fire. No uncommon occurrence. Till she had trained her girls from a one among the women kind of the place, all the work of the house fell on her, attending to her children, mending, making clothes, preparing food, bread included, seeing to the sick, brought for advice, getting their medicine, washing the family clothes, teaching her children, helping her husband, etc. She was often left alone for weeks among the natives. With a regime like that, it is unlikely that Mary Ann Williams had any time for music, other than singing hymns. It's not clear from the records whether she herself played, although she was reported by her daughter to be a good painter and writer, both accomplishments valued in her class of society, but she must have seen to it that her daughters played the piano. In the Auckland Public Library collection, there is a set of hand-copied music manuscript books from the Williams family and volume one says on the inside of the front cover, the Mrs. Williams, Paihia, Bay of Islands, New Zealand, December 1847. If we look at the children of Mary Ann Williams, we find five daughters, Mary Ann, Sarah, Catherine Caroline and Lydia, who in 1847 would have been aged 27, 18, 16, 15 and 13. By 1847, Mary Ann, the eldest, had already got married, so she wouldn't have been one of the Mrs. Williams. So it's the four younger ones we're looking at. We don't know when they acquired their piano. They must have had one to have used the book. The earliest reference to a piano in Pai here that I could find was in 1827, when a Broadwood and Sons piano arrived there. There's a gentleman called Gilbert Mayer, M-A-I-R, who was the trader who brought the piano here. He had served as skipper to the Church Missionary Society ship until it founded on the Hokianga Bar in 1828. He settled in the Bay of Islands in 1825, so he had probably imported the piano in 1827 himself. And we will find some of Gilbert Mayer's correspondence in the library archives here. So the same Broadwood piano is mentioned 15 years later in 1840 by Sarah Matthew, wife of the surveyor Felton, when she arrived in the Bay of Islands and she says, it is woefully out of tune. It is impossible to play it. Um, so since the music books dated 1847, I hope that by the time the Williams family had, had by the time they wrote their names in here, that they had got their piano fixed up. So, looking at the music books themselves, the Williams family, being a family of missionaries, did not have a lot of money for buying sheet music, so they copied their own. And so, the books are blank, ruled with music lines, and they might have borrowed pieces from neighbours or somebody visiting and copied them. Although most of the music must have been copied later than the 1820s, it's nevertheless a snapshot of the way in which music played a part in the life of this family for several generations. Um, this is the index to volume one. So there were sacred songs for the children to learn. These would have been sung at home and in church by the whole family. Uh, this is the three-part round, and they did a lot of um, teaching Māori to sing hymns, and obviously... You know, the, the Māori are very musical people, so this wasn't difficult. Um, and then there were dancers, quadrilles, waltzes, polkas. Some are piano solos, but there's a lot of them for piano duet. And there are also collections of popular tunes arranged in a medley. <coughs> so the collection reflects the activities of the family and their devotions and their recreation. 
The only music for them, of course, was their own. Now I'm going to turn to my second lady, who is Sarah Mayfew, pronounced, according to her husband, Mayfew, not Matthew, because it only had one T. Um, and this is the cover of this book, which Marilyn also gave me, which I have found absolutely fascinating. It is Tessa Duda's transcription of parts of Sarah Matthews' journal, which is um, in the Auckland Library here. So I'm going to tell you what this picture is. This is actually a copy by the wife of um, Thomas Hocken, who founded the Hocken Library in Dunedin. She was a watercolorist, and she copied this from someone else's drawing. Um, if you had been down in official bay below Point Britomart on Friday the 18th of September 1840, you would have seen an odd collection of people. They were gathered to watch the hoisting of the British flag for the first time on the shores of the Waitemata Harbour. There were a number of Māori, a small collection of English men and one woman. There she is. Her name was Sarah Matthew and she was the wife of the surveyor Felton Matthew who had chosen the site for Auckland City. And she describes their journey down from the Bay of Islands in the Cutter um, and you know how they camped here and they camped there and they found this river and this estuary and it was all just relatively uninhabited. So they had to decide where this British city was going to go. Hers is the only account we have of the events of that day, and it seems to have been a fun-filled day with boat races between the various parties, drinking the Queen's health and enjoying music in the evening from Captain Ruff, who was one of the ship's captains, who, she remarks, gave us a few songs to the accompaniment of his guitar, but he had shouted himself somewhat hoarse in honour of Her Majesty in the morning. So, she's the one who gave me the idea for this, the title of this talk, um, which has actually changed since I first thought of it. Um, she did not leave us a collection of music, and she did not live here for very long either, for about seven years, I think. For my purposes, the most interesting entry in the early part of her journal is her note that all her heavy furniture was stowed in the cabin with her, and that she feared every violent roll would loosen the fastenings and send them pell-mell upon me and my devoted piano. This was her cottage piano, which accompanied her to New Zealand on the Westminster. Although Sarah suffered badly from seasickness, she would have had times when she played her piano in the cabin. So here she was, the only European woman for the moment, in a world completely different from the tidy one she'd left in England, or even in Sydney, where she'd been for a few years. Um, without permanent buildings and with a tent for a home. She was a lady with all the judgmental upper middle class values that went with that. <laughs> On meeting Mary Ann Williams, she wrote, a plain sort of motherly person has been in the country 17 years and has a large family of raw, uncouth boys and girls. <laughs> so you have to read it, you know, understanding where she came from. Like her husband, she was an intrepid explorer. On the one hand, she climbed mountains in her voluminous woolen skirt, tearing it and getting very wet in the bush. And on the other hand, when need be, she cooked the la for large quantities of visitors with just the help of a maid on a camp oven in her tent on the White Matter. And the piano lived in a box beside the tent until their house was built. Now, the third lady I'm going to talk about um, was another wife of a clergyman, but of a very different sort. The church missionaries, the group that included Mary Ann and Henry Williams, were a very hard-working, realistic group of settlers. They wanted to bring God to the Māori population, and their form of Anglicanism was called Low Church. It was not concerned much with ritual or church hierarchy. By contrast, some of the clergymen sent out by the Anglican Church were members of the Oxford movement, which was a high church form of Anglicanism, more concerned with proper ritual and ceremony. So here we have um, Bishop George Augustus Selwyn, and he belonged to this group, and arrived with his wife Sarah in 1842. Sarah came from a well-to-do family. Her father, John, Sir John Richardson, was a king's counsel and judge. Her husband, 
George Augustus, had been a pupil at Eton and at St John's College, Cambridge. He came here as Bishop of New Zealand and Melanesia as well, um, with his young wife and five servants. She must have intended to play her piano in New Zealand because she brought it with her and also quite a collection of manuscript and printed music. Her piano arrived in 1843. My poor dear piano, which was sadly banged about in the Tomartin, the ship which brought her to New Zealand, came perforce in a wagon. Only over such a road, it had a nest of firm of fern to soften its fate, but the keys are much loosened and the treble is in a bad state. The bass is as fine as ever. So it was now 16 years since Gilbert Mayer had brought the Broadwood to the Bay of Islands, but the situation regarding upkeep of pianos was still not satisfactory. Sarah Selwyn notes in her diary, Mr. Bainbridge is, a great is not a great proficient in tuning, but will improve. If we look through the music collection at the John Kinder Library of St. John's College, we find some music thought to be left by Sarah Selwyn, but it wasn't all hers. Some volumes have the name of her mother, Emma Richardson, on the flyleaf, and others have the name Harriet Hudson. And then Wanlip. Wanlip is the former mansion of the Hudson family in Leicestershire, and Harriet Hudson was the mother of one of Sarah's cousins, and her name was Caroline Harriet Hudson, later Caroline Abraham, who came here in 1850 with her husband, who became the first principal of St. John's College. So, one of the music editions owned by Caroline, this woman, um, and kept at the John Kinder Library is a two-volume set of 42 Scarlatti sonatas for harpsichord with an introductory movement by Thomas Rosengrave, an English-Irish organist and composer. So, um, this actually dates from 1738-1739. So, this collection of music has battered covers, um, but it's in good condition here and inside. This is a lovely title page from a composer I'd never heard of, William Smethergill. Six concertos for the harpsichord or pianoforte. And you can see that at this time, the piano was a new instrument. So, the, he mentions harpsichord, so if you had one of those, you could play it. But if you had the newer instrument, you could play it too. Now, this says, um, with accompaniment for two violins and violoncello, and the part that's in the library is actually just the piano solo part. So I'm going to have to hunt for the other two parts before we can perform it properly. Now, we get to the piano. The piano itself. The early 19th century piano was not limited to grand and upright models as our modern pianos are. There were four main types cabinet, the cottage, the grand, and the square. And this is a copper plate engraved advertisement from a London warehouse dating from between 1821 and 1826. Um, of course, then as now, a grand piano, this is all written on the sides of this, a grand piano was the most expensive. This man's grand pianos start at 90 guineas, and they go up from there to 180 depending on how much ornament you wanted on your piano. Most settlers coming to New Zealand did not have the money for such lavish purchases, and their choice was norm normally a cottage piano, uh, like Sarah Matthew, or a square piano. By 1860-70, all pianos had iron frames, but in the 1820s they had wooden ones. And the difference is that a wooden frame cannot carry as much tension as an iron frame. So early pianos, were strung with lighter strings, and they were softer in tone. Of course, as pianos got heavier, so did their cases and legs. So the delicate nature of the legs on early pianos is a crude indicator of their age. The cabinet piano was essentially a grand piano with the strings running upright against the wall, and the prices in Mr. Pinnock's catalogue start at 50 guineas. The most expensive of his cabinet pianos is 100 guineas. Very elegant cabinet piano in rosewood, richly inlaid with brasswork and with extra additional keys, which was um, important too. By comparison, a plain square piano was only 32 guineas, 
and it was an easy option to transport to the colony with its detachable legs and lightish body. The fact that when closed it could double as a table may have been an added attraction, and in fact some makers in the late 18th century designed pianos to double as sewing tables. Yeah, 19th century square pianos turn up in auctions from time to time, and they are quite restorable. Features of the square piano. It's not square, it's rectangular, and usually it has six legs. This one has six legs and they all unscrew, they're on wooden threads. And it has one pedal, and it has a sustaining function. And because of the way it's situated, um, you have to use it with your left foot, unlike on a modern piano. So you don't sit right in the middle of that space, you actually have to sit slightly to the left of it, so that your left foot will do the pedaling for you. It's a very simple mechanism with hammers mounted so that they fly upwards to hit the string. They're very light, a fraction of the size of a modern piano hammer. Um, and as I've mentioned, the three drawers. Um, the keys do not depress as far as a key on a modern piano. And the action is much lighter. So you can play very fast without much effort. Um, but it, you also have to control it very, very carefully because if you tweak the wrong note, just a little, it'll play, which has been a big challenge for me. So that's the, what the piano looks like um, when you take the action out. This is the nameplate. So Smith and Company, make, Makers, Upper Rathbone Place, London, and at the top here, sold by Josh Cook with an E. But I think it's rather beautiful. It's got, it's got a lute and something that's probably meant to be a guitar, roses, and the paint unfortunately is showing signs of wear. Um, and on many square pianos the lid is held up by the music stand. And um, the lady in the tutor that I showed you earlier was playing with the lid down. So they must have done that too. <laughs>